Okay, good morning, everybody. And as the first, I do apologize for being so late. And thanks, everybody, for joining us. I will make just a very brief introduction of the, of the whole initiative, mainly for the benefit of our, of our speakers today, also because most of the audience already knows the initiative, and say that the general initiative is called Convergenze Parallele, uh, which is an Italian expression just to say that, okay, two things which are parallel could still have some, uh, some contact points uh, say, even without referring in particular to non-Euclidean geometries. And in this case, actually, the, the two paths that we were referring to were the industrial paths, so the field of industrial applications and the field of, of academic research. So they normally do run in parallel and they do share really a little. And we found out that it was normally in average a pity. And in order to encourage eventually the exchanges about the applicative side and uh, speculative side of research, uh, we tried to establish a few topics which we found out could be interesting uh, for the audience to, to have some inspiration in this direction. Uh, today's talks, actually today, tomorrow, and the day after tomorrow, are the ubiquitous quanta, and so they will be dedicated actually to particular applications, which can be called exotic applications of quantum tools and quantum frameworks. So the whole structure of the, of the initiative is somewhere in between a conference, a workshop, and say uh, an open discussion, uh, a set of lectures. So we, we think we, we try to embed them all inside, uh, inside the initiative. So there have been lectures which were ma mainly, say, explaining some things. So for example, divulgative lectures, like some of those you are going to give. Some other were more open discussions with a kind of more professional and more uh, involved audience. And according to the, to the global structure, we actually have three main topics uh, which are driving us as well, points of references. And one is, uh, is, as you see, the technology and in general, uh, say, research developments. Another one is, okay, in case you really do need these tools to, find a, to fund uh, a startup, for example, or a company, uh, which kind of management tools could you use? For example, IP protection tools, and other stuff like those. So we did have also lect lectures pointing out in this direction. And finally, a third case, or a third, uh, a third thing which has been afforded, was some success stories uh, made by people who have successfully managed to transfer what were their academic researches inside the industrial world. Now, for today, I would say we will mainly deal with complex systems and quantum frameworks and Probably we will have some hints about possible technology transfer, but as we were discussing with Professor De Barros yesterday, uh, it, is, it is certainly a mid-term or long-term tech transfer, so it's nothing which is going to happen tomorrow. Finally, a few acknowledgements. Actually, the, the whole initiative has been co-organized by uh, a spin-off which I have funded, which is called MRS, and the local group of network analysis in the Department for Innovative Engineering. And so I would like to thank them both. And of course, we did have some, uh, some partnerships. Uh, one I would like to point out, because there are two representatives in the audience, is the one with the Department of Mathematics and Physics at the University of Salento. And that's the association The Cube. Uh, the association The Cube is particularly involved in uh, managing technology transfer from the universities or from the academia to the industrial world. Finally, so the, the funds for uh, so coming to the money, uh, actually, the, the initiative was funded by several regional offices and uh, the, the global initiative which funds these kind of, uh, of talks and seminars is called Laboratori dal Basso, which basically means they are labs from the, from the bottom uh, just because of the process of okay, uh, making the, the participants also involved in the decision of the topics which are going to, to be given. And finally, for the agenda of these, uh, of these three days, well, today, actually, you will find out that you know, the, first, uh, the first speaker is not blonde, is not tall, and does not have an American accent. And this is just because of a change which has been performed because of uh, some flight cancellations. And so instead of uh, Professor Trublad from California Irvine, we will have Dr. Sandro Sozzo, who has been previously in the University of Salento. And uh, he has been involved in an interdisciplinary center for researches which is called uh, the Leo Postel, uh, correct me if, you, if I uh, missed the, the pronunciation, in Bruxelles. And he has collaborated with Professor Hertz, and he will make something like a general introduction in this strange quantum cognition word, 
well, say, strange for uh, certainly not for those in the first rows, but probably for, uh, for the others. And uh, as the second uh, and last talk of the day, so we will have a shorter day than, uh, than scheduled, uh, it will be by uh, Professor Emmanuel Haven, uh, and I will leave uh, his introduction to, to Dr. Sandro Sozzo because he knows him uh, much better than I do. And so, just briefly, tomorrow it will be the, the most busy day, actually. We will have both a morning session and an afternoon session. Probably, uh, we will be able to, to have a webinar by Professor Trublad as soon as she comes back to California Vine, because at the moment she is stuck in, uh, in Chicago. And uh, so, say, the, the last lecture is still not confirmed, but we will try to, to manage to, to have this webinar. And finally, on the 12th of September, there will be another lecture by Professor Acacio de Barros, who is the, the, the third uh, speaker of this, uh, of this series. And that will be only a morning session. So, uh, given this brief introduction, okay, you do already have our contacts, and I will invite Dr. Dr. Sozzo for his, for his lecture. Thanks, everybody. Yes. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Okay, yes. So many thanks, Andrea, for your kind introduction. Uh, yes, you are definitely right. I'm not blonde. I'm not, I don't have tall hair, but uh, I'm, I'm here, and this makes the difference. <laughs> so for ladies and gentlemen, first of all, let me, let me thank you all for, um, for participating in this session on uh, the application of quantum theory in cognitive and economic sciences. Uh, and uh, then let me personally talk, uh, thank the, um, the speakers who accepted uh, our invitation, and uh, namely Professor Emanuel Haven of the School of Management of uh, University of Leicester and uh, Professor Acacio de Barros from the University of San Francisco. I, I wish you a very nice and good stay here in Lecce, so I welcome you in, in Lecce. And I apologize with you for uh, the an absence of Professor Jennifer Trublad, who finally could not come here. And uh, so, as, as Andrea correctly said, I, I work in the uh, Center Leo Apostel for Interdisciplinary Studies of the Free University of Brussels, uh, and uh, I contributed to the organization of uh, uh, this sixth session of Laboratori del Basso Convergenze Parallele. I've been involved in this growing research field, which is quantum cognition, for three or four years, but uh, I'm basically a physicist. I was trained as a physicist. And uh, what I originally wanted to do here uh, in this talk was to, to provide you uh, an introductory bridge uh, between the foundations of quantum theory and, uh, and this uh, new research field, which is quantum cognition. But uh, the, so what is the lesson that can be learned from the foundation of quantum theory to quantum cognition? And but then the sudden absence of uh, Professor Trublad then uh, led us to think that I could bother you for much more time than 10 minutes. And so I, I, I finally, uh, we finally decided to, uh, to provide you uh, a more specific talk about our research activity in Brussels. So this is what I would like to discuss with you uh, today, uh, trying to avoid as much as possible technical details. So this talk will consist in two parts. There is a first introductory part that I call the quantum social science. This, uh, this is because uh, this is the title of a book that was recently published by Cambridge University Press and what was written by Professor Aven and uh, by Andrei Krenikov. And the second part will be more specific about the application of quantum structures to concept theory. So uh, let's, let's start with uh, with uh, the, the basics of, uh, of, uh, of quantum theory, summarizing the basics of quantum theory. So quantum theory is one of the building blocks of modern physics because of its unmatched predictive success and its impact on our conception of the physical world and uh, our everyday life. You know that it brought in uh, conceptual novelties marking the departure from uh, ordinary intuition and common sense uh, on which uh, uh, classical physics rests. And, uh, we could say that at the best of our knowledge, quantum theory applies at any conceivable scale, so from elementary particles up to cosmology. 
And you will probably also know that uh, some important uh, uh, technical, uh, technological stuffs uh, are now possible thanks to the foundations of quantum theory, in particular quantum teleportation, cryptography, information, and, uh, and the computation. But you probably also know that uh, uh, after more than one century, after its birth, uh, the, the foundations of the conceptual foundations of quantum theory are still subject of research. And uh, I would like to use the words by one of the big names of uh, the foundations of quantum theory, Richard Feynman, who said, I can safely say that nobody understands quantum mechanics. And in, in fact, uh, there are some uh, specific aspects uh, of uh, quantum theory that appear, uh, let me say, mysterious, puzzling, and so on. Or at least they appeared some years ago. Uh, one of them is, for example, quantum interference. Uh, or, of course, uh, these are connected each other. Another one is uh, wave-particle duality, or Heisenberg uncertainty principle, or non-objectivity non of physical properties. Then there is another puzzling aspect of quantum mechanics, uh, that is entanglement, and by using Schrodinger's words, it is the most characteristic trait of quantum theory. Of course, we have also quantum contextuality, and another interesting aspect is the non-epistemic nature of quantum probabilities. And Professor De Barros will extensively discuss about, uh, about this aspect in his talk. So by using uh, the words of Mermin, we could say that it is a fundamental quantum doctrine that a measurement does not reveal, in general, a pre-existing value of the measured property. But this property, this observed, the value of this observable is actualized during the, the, the act of measurement as a consequence of the interaction between the measured system and the measuring apparatus. But meanwhile, some results have been obtained in the studies on the foundations of quantum theory. In particular, uh, uh, we now know the structural differences between classical and quantum theory. For example, between classical and quantum probability. We more or less know why quantum logic is non-Boolean, the non-Boolean origin of quantum logic, or the fact that quantum probabilities uh, do not satisfy Kolmogorov's axioms of classical probability. And then uh, we also know why, uh, the, why the algebra of quantum observables uh, is non-commutative. What is probably less known uh, is that in the last years, uh, some uh, genuine quantum aspects, uh, some of these uh, mysterious aspects of quantum theory, interference, uh, superposition, emergence, entanglement, have been detected also outside uh, uh, the microscopic world of quantum physics. In particular, the identification of quantum structures outside the microscopic domain of quantum physics and the use of the mathematical formalisms of quantum theory to model experimental data in social science is now a well-established research field. And uh, it is uh, still growing and it is known as quantum cognition. Interesting results have been obtained in the modeling of cognitive and decision processes, for example, in concept theory. I will discuss this aspect. So, in the mechanisms of concept combinations and dynamics. Then in decision theory, for example, uh, Professor Trublad uh, would have discussed about uh, uh, the prisoner dilemma, or uh, disjunction fallacy, or the conjunction effect. And then also uh, important results have been obtained in behavioral economics, uh, in decision making under uncertainty, where the uh, experimental data do not agree with the predictions coming from expected utility theory. The, these are the so-called Allais, Ellsberg or Machina paradox. Other results have been obtained in computer science, in particular in information retrieval and uh, natural language processing. Professor Eman uh, Emanuel Avin will discuss about the application of quantum structures uh, in, uh, in finance, for example. And recently we discovered that uh, also some uh, 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 there, there are some quantum structures also in animal behavior, for example, in the mating competition uh, uh, of a species, of a lizard species. 
Well, so this field, this big field, has been called quantum cognition. And uh, a short remark here, there is the, th these are the first sentences of the Wikipedia page on quantum cognition. And uh, uh, an interesting aspect uh, is that uh, quantum cognition neatly distinguishes itself uh, from uh, uh, quantum approaches to the human brain, uh, from quantum consciousness, from uh, quantum mind. Because it does not presuppose the existence of microscopic quantum processes in the human brain. We are agnostic with respect to this aspect, so we are not incompatible with such an assumption, but our modeling does not require this assumption. Then, okay, here are some highlights. The first ideas on quantum cognition came in the, in the early 90s. It is one of the first papers appearing in, the, uh, in this topic. Uh, in 1995, uh, here you find some, some books that have been published uh, on, uh, on this topic. And then uh, some uh, papers that appeared on important journals uh, talking about us. Uh, for example, this, uh, this paper which appeared on Scientific American uh, had the title of A New Enlightenment. Uh, there is uh, a community that works on uh, quantum cognition or the application of quantum structures outside physics and uh, uh, which each year organizes uh, a workshop. The first one was organized in Stanford in 2007. The last one was organized in Leicester by Emanuel Haven. The next one will be organized in Filsbach uh, in 2014. Coming to our research, uh, there was uh, a very interesting paper that was published by Behavioral and Brain Sciences in 2013, uh, and we wrote by Potos and Busmeier, and we wrote a commentary on it. Uh, here, uh, then, you find also some an award we received uh, uh, concerning our research activity. This aspect is the most important one in this building because it is uh, about uh, grant capturing. So you, you, can, you can capture funds uh, uh, with research on quantum cognition. So this, <laughs> this is an important point. Then, uh, the, final, the last slide of this uh, uh, first part of my talk. What we know is the following. The mathematical formalisms of quantum theory provide a success successful modeling in cognitive and decision processes. Possible questions that uh, I would like to tackle in this uh, in this workshop, providing some uh, also partial answers. Why the quantum mechanical formalism is uh, so efficient in these domains? Is there something deep for this, or it is just a fresh mathematical tool uh, which is more general than uh, the, the typically used classicalities? The second. Uh, can we infer something about the existence of microscopic quantum processes in the human brain from our modeling? And is all this really quantum? So what is the quantumness of our quantum modeling? Is it only the fact that we are using a Hilbert space structure? Should we use the term quantum-like? Fourth question. What about alternative explanations? Do they exist? This, uh, uh, this question arose in uh, our round table in Leicester when uh, 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 I, I said that there is a strong empirical evidence about the quantum nature of, uh, of these aspects. And then there was a guy who is a psychologist who said, uh, no, 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 I, there are also alternative classical Kolmogorovian explanations for all that. So this is an open question whether we can reproduce experimental data by using a more complex Kolmogorovian probability framework, so in a classical framework. So finally, a potential application, so also this is important in this building, so about the possibility of having non-trivial quantum effects on biological systems, or about simulation of mental processes, artificial intelligence, robotics, and uh, economics and finance, for example, black Scholes model of option pricing. Are there consequences, uh, uh, important consequences in, uh, or advantages in using a quantum approach? Then 
then what about the consequences in the random walk hypothesis, which underlies uh, the Black Scholes model of option pricing? You probably will discuss about this. So, and finally, what about semantic analysis, information retrieval, World Wide Web? So, this is this is the potential applications and future directions of uh, our research field. So, coming to something more specific, I would like to come to this quantum challenge in concept theory. I will stop to concept theory. Uh, what is the problem? We have concepts, elementary concepts, individual concepts, and we can form from them combinations of concepts in our thought. So, conjunctions of concepts, disjunctions of concepts. The problem is how we can represent uh, the disjunction, for example, of, of two concepts starting from the representation of the individual concepts. So the easiest uh, way of, to represent all this, so this was the first that was tried following the rules of classical logic. Okay, so we can represent the concepts uh, by sets. So the disjunction of two concepts is the disjunction of the two sets. The conjunction is the conjunction of two sets. This does not work at all. This is the only thing that we can say now. This does not work. So I will try to implement a quantum-like formalism which provides a successful modeling of large da da uh, collection of experimental data uh, on this. On the other hand, understanding uh, the mechanisms uh, and the structure and the dynamics of human concepts uh, is one of the age-old challenges of scientists studying uh, the human mind. This is in particular for two reasons. The first one is that progress in many fields crucially depends on this problem. And the second is that major scientific issues rely on a deeper understanding of how concepts combine. As I told you, much effort has been devoted to these matters, but very few substantial results have been obtained. While I will try to convince you that models of concepts using the mathematical formalism of quantum theory are substantially more successful than classical approaches at modeling data generated in studies on combinations of two concepts. So the experimental data I'm referring to are the, one collect the ones collected by James Hampton in the late 80s. These are considered as uh, very important in, the, in this field, but uh, we have recently discovered that uh, our quantum modeling uh, uh, is, uh, uh, is successful also to model uh, other experimental data coming from other studies uh, and on other aspects. So these, these are the so-called borderline contradictions. So this modeling is, uh, provides uh, a, a unified representation of, uh, for uh, extensive sets of experimental data. So the idea is uh, here we put forward the quantum theoretic modeling of how concepts combine, identifying the quantum aspects uh, that contribute to the successful modeling of the collection of experimental data for the conjunction and disjunction of two concepts, so the ones by Hampton. In particular, uh, we, we see that uh, the quantum effects of superposition, interference, emergence, and contextuality appear in this, uh, in this modeling, and uh, they provide an explanation for the overextension and underextension of membership weights of exemplars with respect to the conjunction and disjunction of concepts. Then I will briefly come to the fact that we performed an experimental test on the combination, on a specific combination of two concepts, and we found that Bell's inequalities are violated. And we provided the quantum representation for our experimental data. This means that probably also entanglement exists between concepts. And finally, we provided, uh, well, an explanatory hypothesis in Fox space uh, uh, according to which uh, human thought uh, is just a, a quantum superposition of a logical thought and an emergent thought. So this is just, uh, this is our pro uh, possible explanation for, uh, uh, for our modeling. So according to the traditional approaches to concept theory, a concept is a container, is a set. 
is a container of what is called instantiations. So according to the classical view uh, that can be traced back to Aristotle, all instances of a concept share a common set of necessary and sufficient defining properties. Well, the first drawback to this idea uh, came from Wittgenstein, who observed that context plays a fundamental role when uh, talking about a concept. So the meaning of a concept depends on the context in, in which it is used. So this definition is too rough. Then there was uh, the extensive work by Eleanor Roche, who showed something more. She said the concepts exhibit graded typicality. So we cannot use secret simplicity there. Uh, set theoretical approach for this. We need a probabilistic or fuzzy set approach. And then uh, the time of Oscherson and Smith came. They propounded this experiment. They asked the people to, to rate, to estimate the typicality of some exemplars uh, with respect to the concepts pet, fish, and to their conjunction pet fish. So they collected the data and they found that uh, some subjects estimate some exemplars. For example, one of them was guppy. The, in Europe, we have goldfish. Uh, that scores a high typicality with respect to pet fish, but its typicality with respect to pet and with respect to fish is low. And this violates one of the basic rules of classical probability theory. This effect is called the Skup effect. Then there were these experiments by Hampton, who found the following. There are several exemplars. There is an extensive collection of exemplars, according to which the membership weight of these exemplars with respect to the conjunction of two concepts is higher than the membership weights of this exemplar for one of both the constituent concepts. Another deviation. This, this deviation was called overextension and the similar effect you have in the underextension. How we can explain the way in which subjects rate membership weights or typicalities and generally speaking uh, combined concepts. We proposed an alternative approach uh, that was called the scope, uh, starting from our research on the foundations of quantum theory and the nature of quantum probability and its structural differences with respect to classical probability. The novelties of our approach is that the concept is not a container of instantiations in our approach, but it is an entity that is in a, in a state and it can be in a different state if it interacts with, for example, another concept. Another, another concept. Exemplars of concepts are regarded as different states of the concept. A concept is fruit, vegetables, okay? Exemplars are apples, tomatoes, broccoli, and so on. So uh, what is a context? A context is a factor that influences the concept changing its state. And what is typicality? Typicality is an observable. is an observable quantity with different values for different states of the concept. Already at this stage, you can recognize something coming from uh, operational foundations of quantum theory in this approach. And indeed, a state context property formalism was worked out. In this formalism, the Gupp effect is explained by considering the conjunction pet fish as pet in the context fish, or fish in the context pet, it is the same. So if we consider an exemplar, it is not a point in a set, it is a state. And this state of pet has a low typicality in absence of context, while it scores a high typicality under the context if fish. Well, 
there are formulas, so I, I ask you to trust me uh, uh, in this quality, qualitative explanation uh, about that. But uh, it is possible to provide uh, a complete quantum mechanical representation in complex Hilbert space, uh, explaining not only the data by uh, Oshersen and Smith, uh, but also the data we collected in our uh, experimental test uh, we performed on pet fish and pet fish. But we did something more. Uh, in the sense that, uh, well, this is, well, I, well, yes, I would like to discuss this. Uh, this is our uh, possible explanation for the fact that uh, there are deep analogies between quantum particles and uh, conceptual structures and the concepts. And this is connected with the fact that uncertainty and the potentiality are treated in conceptual structures and quantum theory in the same way. The first thing is that they are modeled in quantum probability theory in a very different way than their modeling in classical Kolmogorovian probability theory. This is the main, the main connection. If you consider a quantum measurement process, the measurement context, the measurement apparatus, actualizes one possible outcome, provoking an indeterministic change of state of the microscopic quantum particle that is measured. You have pure potentiality as a consequence of contextuality, the interaction with the measurement context. On the other hand, when a subject is asked to estimate the membership, for example, of an exemplar with respect to one or more concepts, we have uh, the same contextual influence. It is not of a physical type, it is of, of a cognitive type, but it is a context contextual influence. And this determines a, a transition from potential to actual, where only one outcome, the decision, is actualized in a set of possible outcomes. So, at variance with the classical Kolmogorovian probability, quantum probability enable, enables coping with this kind of contextuality and pure potentiality, taking into account also interference effects uh, through the use of complex numbers. This is less important. Each time you have a situation in which the context interacts with the given entity, it can be a physical entity, microscopic physical entity, it can be a, a conceptual entity, and uh, the interaction is neither controllable nor predictable, then you cannot use a classical Kolmogorovian probability theory from a statistical point of view. You need either the, the quantum formalism or a generalization of it. In any case, you need a non-Kolmogorovian probability framework. So, this is what we did with the Hamptons data. We showed, we provided necessary and sufficient conditions that should be satisfied for a set to membership of membership weights to be represented in a Kolmogorovian probability framework. So, if we have two concepts, A, B, and for example, the conjunction of these concepts, A and B, and uh, we collect uh, experimentally their membership weights, then uh, these weights can be represented in a classical probability framework if and only if uh, these two inequalities are simultaneously satisfied. Then we took Hampton's data and we found that uh, many of them violate these uh, one or both these two inequalities. Here I, I, I reported just uh, the case of Mint the exemplar mint that was tested with respect to food, plant, and food and plant. You have here a phenomenon of, uh, it is overextension. Yes, this, this is violated, the, the first one. So this suggests that probably something that is non-classical is occurring. And we provided the quantum modeling uh, that uh, uh, fits uh, all experimental data collected by Hampton. This is the modeling. This is the, the expression of the membership weight of A and B, starting from the membership weights mu A and mu B. M square and N square are co convex coefficients. Their, their origin will be known later on. 
And then we have the appearance of this term, which can be specified, and it is the interference term. This is the same interference term that occurs in the quantum double slit experiment. So it is possible to provide a concrete uh, model in uh, a definite Hilbert space, uh, this is C3, and so it is possible to provide a quantum representation for the concepts A and B for the interference term and also for this interference angle. But with the, in this modeling you can provide a solution for all exemplars of uh, uh, the concepts uh, uh, considered by Hampton. And also, this, this modeling also works, uh, as I told you, for other sets of experimental data on the conjunctions of two concepts. So it is general enough uh, to, uh, to fit also other sets of experimental data. Then, the same thing can be repeated for the disjunction of two concepts. The same thing. You can provide a similar modeling for, for this, and also in this case, uh, if you consider two concepts, A and B, and their disjunction, A or B, you have exemplars that show under extension. So the membership weight of the disjunction is uh, less than the membership weight of one or both concepts. So we have also in this case a deviation from, or from the basic rules of classical probability theory. But to show this in a rigorous way, we prove the theorem which provides necessary and sufficient conditions for having a set of membership weights represented in a classical Kolmogorovian probability framework. I considered this example also in this case, in the case of mushroom, we have a violation of the second inequality with respect to fruits and vegetables and fruits or vegetables. So also in this case, we have a violation of the rules of probability theory and you have a violation of several rules. For example, the De Morgan rules are violated here. And uh, it is possible to provide uh, a quantum uh, modeling in Hilbert space also in this case, but uh, here I would like also to provide you with uh, uh, an explanatory hypothesis of how subjects choose when they want to estimate the membership weights of exemplars with respect to concepts and their combination. The new thing is that they don't not only combine the concepts in a classical way, so fruits, vegetables, fruits or vegetables, but in their mind, in their mind there is a new emerging concept, fruits or vegetables, that uh, is, uh, is appearing, is emerging. Exactly like in quantum theory, the superposition of two states appears when you combine them. It is just the same thing. So the idea is the following. And for which exemplars uh, this occurs? For those exemplars in particular, for which subjects start to raise doubts whether they are fruits or vegetables. This was evident from tom tomato. You estimate the tomato with respect to fruits, vegetables, and fruits or vegetables. Probably people start to think that they don't know whether it is a fruit or a vegetable. So it has a very high typicality with respect to the new emerging concept, fruits or vegetables. So we have a new dynamics in human thought with, which has not a logical nature. It has a an emergent nature. And so the dominant dynamics of reasoning is emergence while classical logical reasoning is a secondary. And this can be explained in a rigorous way by providing a quantum modeling for this data in a Fox space, not in a Hilbert space. So a Fox space is basically a sum, the simplest Fox space, is basically a direct sum of two Hilbert spaces this is a sector one Hilbert space. This is a, here you can model the conceptual part of reasoning. Here is a tensor product Hilbert space when you combine concepts in a classical way. And uh, okay, so 
if we consider how subjects estimate the membership weight of tomato with respect to fruits, vegetables, and fruits or vegetables, there are two superposing processes in the human mind. The first is the classical one. One considers two identical exemplars of tomato. To the first, for the first, they wonder whether it is a member of fruit. For the second, they wonder whether it is a member of vegetables. If we have two positive answers, the conjunction rule is satisfied. They are both members, so it is a member of the conjunction. If one or only one of them is satisfied, then we have the conjunction rule that is satisfied. So, rules of classical logic. Of course, things are probabilistic in this case, but this is close to classical logical thinking. But superposed with this process, there is the emergence process in which subjects reflect whether tomato is a member of the new concept of fruits or vegetables. This is a completely new dynamics. And this is over, uh, superposed with the classical logical dynamics. So our modeling of human reasoning is located in the whole of Fox space. Human reasoning in this uh, hypothesis is a superposition of emergent reasoning and logical reasoning. It is possible to provide the quantum modeling also in the case of this junction, but I first wanted to provide you a possible explanation for this modeling. So also in this case, you have that uh, the collection of data uh, by Hampton on the disjunction of two concepts uh, is fit by, uh, agrees with this modeling in Fox space. So this is the most important aspect. Human thought is a superposition of a dominant dynamics while this dominant of emerging thought and the secondary dynamics of logical thought. Why the first is dominant? Because it is uh, so abundant in human thought. This is not only typical in concept theory. You have the same effects and the same quantum modeling in at least two other areas of decision making. One of them is the disjunction effect and the conjunction fallacy, where you have deviations from classical logical rationality. And the other one is behavioral economics, where classical approaches based on expected utility theory are uh, experimentally violated uh, by real decisions of human subjects. These are Ellsberg paradox, LA paradox, Machina paradox, and so on. The same modeling, exactly the same modeling, can be applied uh, to these two systems. And the reason is the same. So the idea was uh, to consider these deviations from classicality as fallacies, as effects. Gupp effect, pet fish problem, uh, Ellsberg paradox, uh, disjunction, uh, uh, fallacy, conjunction effect, and so on. Our explanation is a different one. What has been called fallacy, effect deviation, is the consequence of the dominant dynamics, and its nature is emergence. While what is, has been considered as a default to deviate from classical logical reasoning is just the consequence of a secondary form of dynamics. Just to conclude, uh, here I, I don't want to come into technical details, but uh, we collected a set of experimental data. We found uh, on uh, the combination of two concepts, uh, we constructed the Bell's inequalities. This is the typical procedure to, to find entanglement, whether Bell's inequalities are violated. So we constructed the Bell's inequalities. We found that they are violated by, experimentally violated by, in our cognitive test. We provided the quantum representation in the Hilbert space C2 times C2. We think that we have found entanglement in the combination of two concepts. Certainly in the case of uh, the concept we considered, and we think that uh, concepts are generally also entangled. And uh, wh what is that connects them? Meaning, of course. So this, uh, this is just uh, uh, the mathematical construction. This is, these are the, the exemplars we considered. 
And well, very, very briefly, the conclusions. Uh, several findings in concept research led us to recognize the need for quantum modeling. Uh, it is possible to explain uh, the data by, collected by James Hampton on the conjunction and disjunction of two concepts for which uh, it does not exist uh, a, a classical Kolmogorovian theory explaining them in terms of quantum interference, uh, emergence and superposition. There, there is also, also another aspect that is entanglement that, uh, that uh, plays a role in the mechanism of concept combination. And finally, we uh, considered also, we showed that also emergence occurs in the mechanism of concept combination. And our uh, explanatory, we, we put forward the explanatory hypothesis according to which human thought is a superposition of a, a quantum emergent thought and a quantum logical thought. So, last slide, it is, uh, it is also in this case for, um, for the building where we are. So, some insights that uh, we can, uh, we can drive, uh, draw from, from our results here. We have that quantum structure systematically appears uh, in thought processes. So, this could suggest that human mind works as a system which is closer to a quantum computer than to a classical computer. This is an insight. This should be explored, of course. The second aspect is that the resources of quantum computation can be implemented in other types of realizations than microscopic quantum entities and qubits. Because you can simulate quantum aspects and quantum effects also in cognitive domains, also in macroscopic physical domains. So there are two possible conclusions that we can get from this insight. This, the problems connected with the control of microscopic entities would be avoided. And the second, which this is a big problem for experimentalists, and the second one, the elaboration of macroscopic devices which perform quantum algorithms, thus simulating quantum computers. Well, this, uh, this is what uh, we would like to, to explore in the future, but for the time being, I just thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Respect the time, so we'll know. Yeah, say, I think we would have time for, say, some dark questions, and probably I will leave more complicated questions for the, for the final, uh, for the final take of the ball, you want to Yes, please. Uh, just one, uh, one recommendation to, to use the microphone when, when asking the questions, otherwise the, the questions will not be heard by the audience. There is free in the audience, of course. So just pass the microphone, and then we'll speak back to you. So any questions for the speaker? Thank you. Uh, first question. How you can represent your uh, quantum uh, version of the, of the human thought or process thought as a, a non-local process? You, you have this, of course, if, if you have a quantum, if, if you have a quantum, you can represent in many cases as a, uh, how to say, non-local but deterministic, completely deterministic process. Is this map can be done in this? And second question, how much the culture influence this process of combining com concepts? Probably cul different culture combines uh, concepts uh, in different way, I, I suspect. If I yes, I, I just a second. I I can repeat you what I understood from the question, but then then you should confirm whether <laughs> I'm right. <laughs> so the first question was about uh, the fact that uh, uh, he was wondering whether our quantum modeling uh, 
uh, in the case for the entanglement of two concepts uh, reveals uh, a deterministic world down on local. Is it this the question? I think that uh, it is uh, exactly the opposite thing. In the sense that uh, things are probabilistic in this case. And uh, I think that they are irreducibly probabilistic. Uh, they are not deterministic. And you know that when uh, you take a decision, you are actualizing one possible outcome. So the, 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 the outcome of your decision is not uh, prefixed before the decision process. It is actualized through the interaction between the subject who is interviewed, who is asked the question, and the interviewer. So it is an interaction. The second aspect uh, is that uh, I would not talk about non-locality for uh, uh, a simple reason. We have not spatial separation here. How we could interpret it? So, and uh, indeed, and probably you can, you can tell something more about that. Uh, this, would, this would constitute a problem in the sense that mental processes are specially limited or bound. So, and then you can also uh, admit, uh, for example, communication between the different parts. So this means that uh, uh, we have entanglement and we can prove the existence of entanglement by providing a quantum model in the tensor product Hilbert space uh, in which the state representing your decision is not product state, it is an entangled state. So you have a violation of Bell's inequalities you have that a, a Kolmogorovian probability framework uh, is, does not exist for this case. You provide a quantum modeling. You have entangled state. You can have more entangled measurements. So you have not product measurements as in standard quantum modeling. But you don't have non-locality. Because you don't have and you cannot interpret at the present stage of things uh, special separation. The measurement could be a compound measurement as a, both on both concepts as a whole entity. So I would avoid uh, using, using the term non-locality. And uh, this, from the microscopic point of view of quantum physics, is justified. Uh, you can have a violation of Bell's inequalities uh, with entanglement and uh, without having non-locality, or without proving in this way non-locality. This is the locality loophole, for example, in some experiments of this kind, where you perform a, a overall measurement on the whole system as a unit entity, for example, with uh, heavy ions. Uh, sorry, the second question. There is the second question. The influence on culture. Yes, this would be a very interesting question. And uh, I think that if you consider, but this is just an insight, uh, uh, if you consider a different situation, a different culture, or different people, and so on, you can have different results. But what has been observed till now is that uh, these deviations are independent from, for example, uh, the scientific background of people or from cultural background of people that are asked. you have some paradoxes and some uh, deviations. So these effects are in any case systematic. And uh, they can be predicted, predicted. They can be modeled in a specific way. They are structured. So this means uh, that they can be different if different groups of persons are considered. But in each case, uh, they can be modeled. Which means that there is uh, something statistically significant and uh, this cannot be due only to emotional aspects uh, or to irrational influence uh, on the subjects that are asked. The fact that they can be structured, and they can be structured in a very pre precise way, tells you that there is probably something deeper in this. These deeper things think is not only, could not be only quantum. In the case of a concept combination, it is quantum perfectly quantum. You have the whole quantum machinery that is involved in the dynamics, in, uh, you have a Born probabilistic rule and so on. I don't think that the mechanism, that concepts are so crystallized structures uh, as, for example, quantum particles. 
they are less crystallized, then probably quantum formalism is not enough to cope with such kind of experimental data. Sorry? Probably there is an historical uh, aspect. If he, the ideas of what is food and what is vegetable or what is fish may change in time. Yes, but uh, there are also some specific rules according to which if you have seeds, uh, then uh, you have a fruit and so on. So. <laughs> So in this case, for example, typically uh, uh, tomato is considered as a fruit. This was uh, new for me. <laughs> but since it has seeds, uh, it is fruit. OK. OK. Thank you.